is a cheap e-bike an alternative to a small car? Well, today I'm going to be comparing the Polana M6 Pro e-bike against the cheapest new car sold in Australia. Inside this truly massive cardboard box is the e-bike featuring a 1000 watt motor. Polana have provided this unit free of charge, but I'll be giving my own unbiased opinion. And at first I wasn't sure how to go about taking it out of the box since it is so large. It appears to be somewhat assembled and well packed together with plenty of cushioning. I thought it was best to lift it straight out of the box, off of the floor of course, as the table was a little bit too high. The first part to come out were the large foam ends, and I'd suggest keeping all of this just in case you need to return it. And unlike a normal push bike, this is quite a bit heavier, and I would strongly recommend getting some help when it comes to getting it out of the box. Most of the frame appears to be protected with foam, with adequate padding around fragile areas such as the gears. And before we fold out the bike, it needs its large 48 volt 17.5 amp hour battery, which is packed separately, I would assume due to safety concerns. It's also thankfully easy to take in and out of the bike, using a key to hold itself in place and cut power. Some e-bikes will have their batteries hidden inside the frame, and without the ability to take them out easily. The only assembly that's required is the attachment of the bell, pedals, and of course the aforementioned battery pack. Then it's simply a matter of folding out the frame, locking the clip, and flipping up the handlebars. And here we have the assembled e-bike. This pro configuration costing about 2000 Australian dollars, which features a 1000 watt geared brushless rear hub motor. To make the ride on rough terrain a little more bearable, there's pneumatic shock absorbers at the front and also shock absorbed rear suspension. This bike has eight speed Shimano gears allowing you to assist with pedaling. And as far as e-bikes go, they can get a lot more expensive. And what's currently the cheapest car with an automatic transmission you can buy here in Australia? So this, is the MG 2022 MG3, which is basically the cheapest car you can buy here in Australia, brand new. Some might say it's not very powerful with a fairly basic 1.5 liter inline four engine. But these days, most people after the cheapest new car money can buy it with an automatic transmission, don't really care how much horsepower the engine delivers. They want something small, easy to get to and from work in. And any styling or flares of sportiness are welcome additions. Alloy wheels are standard, even on the cheapest model. And at the moment, this obnoxious yellow color doesn't cost extra. With some e-bikes costing well over 4,000 Australian dollars, twice the price of the Polana M6 Pro, that 1000 watt motor is nothing to take for granted. But that speed and added load capacity the engine brings would be pretty useless without adequate braking. At the front and rear are aluminium alloy hydraulic disc brakes, which after testing I can say stop the bike really well. When it comes to using the bike, first you've got to turn the key to the on position. Then holding down the power button, the onboard display will light up and by default the front and rear lights are on. And speaking of the lights, they're bright enough, although I wish the onboard display dimmed a little more for nighttime riding. At the rear is the red tail light and there's even a brake light that activates every time you press one of the brake levers. To get the bike moving using the motor, you can set your desired assistance level between one and five, then press down on the throttle lever, with level one being the lowest and five being the highest level of assistance as seen on the display. So we're ready to go out and give it a try, right? Well, there is one issue that stood in my way. One major hurdle I had to overcome was the constant error 24 motor failure code that I was getting on the e-bike. And it turns out this was due to how it was manufactured back in the factory. There are zip ties along the frame that hold the motor cable in place. However, it was zip tied too close to the connector and it actually damaged the back of it because it was putting a lot of strain on it. And I managed to re-zip tie the connector along the frame in a little bit of a better position and this did alleviate the problem but I had to be careful not to move it around too much because the connector did have some damage so that is something to be aware of. Finally I'm out riding the bike. It's a bit of a surreal experience at first due to the very responsive and powerful motor. Acceleration is almost instantaneous, getting up to speed is very easy and I quickly found myself always using the highest pedal gearing possible. Even though I'm pedaling along with the motor, it's basically no effort at all. I could totally just not pedal at all, but your potential battery range would reduce. So one area the e-bike is definitely challenged is with storage and your ability to actually bring things places. So a small car, even one as small as this MG3, has a huge advantage when it comes to overall storage capacity. But that's not to say the Polana M6 can't carry anything. 
There is a tray above the rear wheel that adds some capability to bring stuff with you. The first bit of luggage I added was an old camera bag and I simply zip tied it on. This proved very useful for holding my cameras, tie down straps, small toolkit and anything I couldn't fit in my backpack. Even across bumpy terrain it stayed on nice and securely. And since it's listed as a mountain bike it should fare pretty well off road. The large tyres along with the decent suspension meant I wasn't aching after doing a lot of dirt testing. The hilly paths along the river provided a good mix of long straights, steep inclines that would be a real slog to get up on a normal push bike, and just about every type of terrain if you're feeling brave enough. This bike is really sturdy and after the shakedown I can say it performed really well. I even did a lot of riding with a few different payloads, all of which made no noticeable difference to performance. Back on a sealed path though, I encountered a rather deflating problem. Since this bike is so big and heavy, a tyre puncture can be a real problem, and I had a really big puncture to the rear tyre, and I couldn't just wheel it along, I had to actually lift the back of it up because that tyre is so big, it was flopping around a lot and was potentially going to damage the wheel guard or destroy the inner tube. So keep in mind, you're gonna wanna have at least an air pump with you and a puncture repair kit. And that inner tube took a bit of effort to partially remove from the rim. It also took some time to find the leak as the tyre had moved away from the original puncture spot. But after carefully listing for the hiss, I eventually found the puncture. Thankfully, not torn and seemingly isolated to this one small area. Time to repair it, beginning with some surface roughening, followed by an application of glue. Once it had set, I was able to apply the patch, being sure to hold it on for several minutes. The bike was now operational once again, and I still can't believe that puncture didn't even occur during the off-road testing, but on a paved footpath. And if you're riding around quite a lot, I definitely suggest having a little air pump and a puncture repair kit, but also this little tool kit, which was provided along with the bike. But how fast exactly can this bike go? This bike has really good acceleration and can go pretty fast. I was able to clock over 50 kilometers of hour pretty easily on flat ground but I find a more comfortable speed of about 32 kilometers an hour on level two assist setting much more viable. And honestly, you don't wanna be going too fast because you gotta remember you are riding a pedal assisted bike. And when going uphill, I only ever had to put it into level three assist mode to get up hills comfortably at speed. And traveling from a full charge across all the tests I performed, carrying camera gear, a backpack, lots of hills, off-road terrain, and lots of start and stopping, the battery lasted 52 kilometers. And I feel this is pretty much a worst case scenario. In that regard, I'm pretty impressed. And charging from flat to 100% took seven hours and the charger was pretty warm, reaching a surface temperature of 59 degrees Celsius. Another thing to consider is a car would require a driver's license, registration, insurance, and of course the ongoing cost of fuel if it has an internal combustion motor. None of those are a thing with an e-bike, although you do have to charge it. But if you do charge it at work, it won't cost you anything. Okay, and what about a real world scenario? I rode it to and from work and honestly, I had a great time. I was easily able to bring my laptop, lunchbox and backpack across town in decent time. And I planned to do it again as I found a route that meant I basically never had to ride on a main road. Once I got through the initial teething problems, it was honestly a really good bike to ride around. After doing the 20 kilometers to and 20 kilometers back from work, it was honestly an easy ride that took about 45 minutes. And honestly, in heavy peak hour traffic, it can take me longer to get there by car. This is honestly a really good alternative to a small car if you need an easy commute to work and don't have to carry a lot of stuff with you. Thank you very much for watching and thanks to Palana for sending this over and I had a good time using it. You have a good day and I'll see you in the next video.